Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Wow. <laughs> Boy, I never even thought that out of all this time, I would actually sit through something this strange and bizarre of my entire life. But it wouldn't matter to me, because I know I've seen this before. And it's been such a long time since I've seen it all the way back to one of my bad childhood memories of sitting through this god-awful piece of shit. However, it made it up for the fact that I actually saw this on TV way back when it was very popular. But this movie, I swear to God, is one of those films that, that you're just going to say to yourself, what the fuck did I just watch? Well, this is one holiday film you will never forget. Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. That's right. This piece of shit holiday film that was made back in 1964 by executive producer Joseph E. Levine. The same man that owns Embassy Pictures. Actually created something this awful, this annoying, this silly, and this radically, strangely bizarre film that you ever seen that it just makes you wonder, is this is as bad as Planet Nine from Outer Space? Well, it's far from it. I mean, yes, it does have sort of a uh, so bad it's good kind of quality to it. You could tell how cheaply bad this film was going for. They knew how bad it was going to be. Hell. <laughs> They even knew how excited it was going to be to see a stone Santa Claus, you know, being kidnapped by Martians from Mars. Well, that's what I had to sit through. But I don't know. But I'll tell you this, though. I remember watching this movie even as a child, especially when I started to see this film constantly on Mystery Science Theater 3000. For those who don't know, because that's one of my favorite shows growing up, when it was on Comedy Central and Sci-Fi Channel, it's a show about a man who hangs out with two robot sidekicks who winds up being trapped inside a spaceship by an evil mad scientist. And his plan was to force them into watching really bad movies. And I mean it, really bad films, enough for them to make fun of it. And that's one of those films that I'm about to review today. And boy, was this a piece of shit DVD that I've ever purchased. Because I bought this at the 99 cent store for <laughs> simply doy 99 cents. And it's a really crappy DVD at, at that because, because you can tell how cheaply made this cover art looks. From the back to the front. Yeah, and and considering that this is a public domain DVD that I purchased, well, the transfer of this DVD is beyond shit. Yeah, this was taken directly from a crappy 16mm uh, print of, of the entire film. That doesn't look any you know, special in between. However, they did later release a new DVD and Blu-ray that's remastered in uh, in blazing color. So the transfer definitely blows away this piece of shit DVD that I got. Yeah, it's just awful. Well, <laughs> but if that doesn't make it up for that, I'm going to review the entire film to see how awful you're going to be sitting through. But here it goes. The movie stars John Call, Leonard Hicks, Vincent Beck, Bill McCutcheon, Victor Stiles, Donna Comforty, Chris Mumph. Chris Mumph? Strange for her last name. Peter Sidora, who actually went on to do other films. Yeah, I'm, I'm faintly familiar from her because not only for this film, but also the fact that 
She even sang the theme song to this movie. And she also uh, went on to do other films such as Hairspray, True Beverly Hills, even The Naked Gun, Freddy Free, and The Fur, The Final Insult. But it winds up in bad films like Butterfly and The Lonely Lady. Yeah. She was a former child actress, you know, coming from Broadway. But she can't act for shit. Layla Martin and Charles Wren. And it's directed by Nicholas Webster. You're going to be shit phrase for life. So here it goes. The movie begins sending a planet called Mars. A Martian family, including all the Martians, which are all dressed up by wearing those football helmets up with those two antenna wires hooked up on top of it and connected through a huge line tube yeah, all dressed up in green with the cape and all in the face Kilmar and Mommar, both King Martian, the father and Mom Martian, the mother are very worried about their children Balmar and Gilmar yeah, both boy Martian and girl Martian as brother and sister are watching way too much television from Earth, especially when they spotted a news reporter from Kid TV interviewing Santa Claus at his workshop in the North Pole. Now Santa Claus, you know, smoking a pipe. Yeah, goodness knows what what he's doing uh, while he's helping with his uh, elves. Yeah, and as well as Mrs. Claus, already excited that she's on TV, and he's saying. Oh, my hair is all messed up. Oh, I'm on TV. Yay! That sort of way. Now, prior to this, Kilmar decided to contact an ancient 800-year-old Martian sage named Trochum, which actually means genius in Yiddish, which, yeah, for those who are Jewish, you'll probably understand. They're actually advertised that the children of Mars are growing very distracted over their society of an overly rigid structure so of course their education is already being fed to their brains for a machine right there and they're basically not allowed to have their freedom of thought so children had noted that for centuries the only way to help children is to allow their freedom and be allowed to have fun so as a result of that they needed to find a Santa Claus figure like the one they saw from Earth they leave Trojum's cave and their Martian leaders, that includes uh, an evil Martian named Boldar and his assistants, Stobol and Shim, they decided to abduct Santa Claus from Earth and bring him to Mars. So as the Martians could not distinguish between all the other fake Santas, who are basically their helpers from the city, they actually kidnap two children from Earth, Billy and Betty, in order to find the real Santa. So they did, once once they went inside the North Pole, they spotted, get this, a cheaply horrible looking polar bear that's actually attacking them. So they wound up hitting inside and then they started to spot the Santa's workshop when in reality it was a tall robot named Totem. Oh brother. Which the Martians have hired to kidnap Santa Claus, uh, especially when he, when one elf was trying to stop him. <laughs> See, he hell, he Santa Claus even thought that this was a huge toy, so he was even treating him, the robot like one. So since that didn't work out, <laughs> the Martians finally came in, and decided to shoot their lasers, which you don't see any lasers. Yeah, their laser gun, and they actually froze two of the elves. Yeah, you know, trying to stop them, as well as Mrs. Claus, and they're all frozen stiff like this. Yeah, you can see how they move along. Well, and they say they'll wear off eventually. <laughs> so, um, already being kidnapped with the two children inside in jail, they, all three of them decided to escape. You know, from Bardar. That leads to a big fight between. Kilmar and Boldar, yeah, it's sort of like a fight that's taken directly from <laughs> from all these other 60s movies I've seen or something like that. And so this actually predates uh, 
Batman when it comes to all that fighting scenes and close-ups and all that. Yeah, this is a 1964 film, so <laughs> what do you expect? But once they, they are safe after being floated from space, but they finally came back as a result of this. And of course, this was even before this whole thing happened. They also met uh, Kilmars' dopey assistant named uh, Dropbo. He goes around meeting them. <laughs> He's actually eating chocolate ice cream, you know, taking those pills. And yes, you're going to see this a lot. He actually eats all these foods, you know, as well as all the other Martians do, by taking all these pills. So, very common if you're in space or so, by taking pills <laughs> you know, for food. Now he was taking all of that, so I, I feel like yeah, all of them are are, are taking drugs. <laughs> okay, I, I'm I'm getting over past that, but it gets even worse. But once they finally arrive inside their home, you know, Santa Claus, Billy, and Betty decided to build themselves a toy factory inside the room, so they can make toys for the children. However, Baldar as well as Stobo and Shim decided to sabotage the factory and changing all the programs so they make the toys incorrectly wrong. Uh, to make the toys incorrectly. Yeah, that also includes all the dolls you know, going through wrong places. Yeah, all the bats turn into uh, tennis rackets and a toy train that looks like, as we speak, a regular train. Oh wow. And if that wasn't even worse, um, Dropo was now being dressed as Santa Claus, yes, yeah, since this was one of his second suits that he had, was being kidnapped by them. Now, Baldar was basically mistaking him for Santa. So as a result of this, Santa and the children came back to the factory to make more toys, already being discovered that it's already been tampered. Baldar and Stobo came back to the factory to make a deal with Kilmar. But when they finally saw the real Santa Claus, they realized that the plan has been foiled, so... But already at this point, Dropo was already tricking the guard Shim to escape. And then, of course, it leads to a huge fight, which everybody in the factory was just going crazy by shooting all these uh, toy guns and all these other toys and everything by shooting a water gun in, on Boldar, and, and the whole thing was going crazy. And <laughs> they're fighting until they finally stopped with Boldar and Stillborn Shim and rested them until Santa finally noticed Dropo acting like him and he also said that Dropo would make a good Martian Santa as a result of this. So Kilmar agrees to let Dropo be a, a Martian Santa Claus and, while sending Santa and the children back to Earth and then the movie ends. <sighs> Boy that I've seen everything <laughs> and I've seen plenty of bad movies, even Christmas films like this one. And you know you're in trouble when Dropo is the only good character in this movie. In fact, <laughs> he is the only good character in this film. Because he's not only is is this character a comic relief, you know, he goes around, you know, dressing up as Santa Claus and he's like <laughs> he's like, you know, very dopey and and all this <laughs> all this crazy stuff that he does. This is since he loves Santa Claus and Christmas and all that. And of course he's always eating, you know, all the foods by taking all these pills. Wow, he's probably the only interesting character in this entire planet of this godforsaken movie. Everybody in this film is not only, you know, the worst, but some of these characters are just so really bad that it's like I'm watching a really bad Little Rascals meets the Free Stooges type of humor, if I ever saw one. Yes, and they even act like that, too. <laughs> Actually, that would have been cool. The Little Rascals meets the Free Stooges. <laughs> that would have been awesome. If they made a crossover back then, but they never did. Oh, but this movie had a whole level of bad. E even Planet Nine from Outer Space was a, a huge masterpiece compared to this. I mean, the acting in this movie was atrociously bad, and I wouldn't believe how bad they really were. Um, especially the Martian kids. They, in fact, uh, one of the kids turned out to be, to be Pia Sidara, who actually happens to 
Oh, you're going to love this. Actually sing the theme song to this entire movie. There's actually an annoying theme song called Hooray for Santa Claus. So, yes, and they were playing it on the opening and the closing of the film. You basically hear an annoying tune being played to death. <laughs> oh, God. You, it, it, to make matters worse, even at the end of the credits, you can even see the lyrics. I, I'm not kidding. You actually saw that. And, yes, and both of them are being played in somewhat of a cheaply animated uh, sequence where you can see Santa Claus, you know, moving around. And even worse, the credits is actually being misspelled. Yeah, between each and every one. Oh god, but nevertheless, the song Hooray for Santa Claus! This is the kind of music that you get stuck in your head for hours. And it'll never get back. <laughs> oh god. It's really bad. Oh, uh, the costume design is, is just laughably awful. The sets, too, are just, uh, it seems like it's borrowed from any other sets that you see in high school. With the polar bear and everything. <laughs> and the alien rocket ship has a cylinder, which almost looks like something out of a, uh, a beer can mixed in with cigarettes built in. Yeah, and it shoots some flames on, on the bottom. <laughs> on the other hand, I don't know. <laughs> It's, it's one of those films that's so overly bizarre, you're thinking to yourself, if Santa Claus was going to be the hero of this film, stopping all these Martians. Well, actually, I mean, the title, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, is, is obviously misleading, because Santa Claus doesn't really conquer them so much. Actually, there's only three Martians that were evil. Yet, one evil Martian named Baldar with two assistants, Stobo and Shim, now stopping Santa Claus. Nothing else. Oh, boy. Santa's workshop looks as, as cheaply made as it could be. But, <laughs> look who's talking. I don't know, but, you know, I think the good thing about this movie, though, was that at least... It did become one of my favorite episodes of Mystery Science Theater 3000 because you just can't help but laugh at all their comments that they make throughout this entire rigid film. And not only that, there was even a newscaster that looks like Dick York from Bewitch. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't believe that. And then, well, since I did watch it on a crappy transfer DVD, you notice that there's so many sound being cut off and all these uh, technical faults they put into the film with all these film scratches and everything it just looks so, <laughs> so laughably bad you can tell how cheaply made that this movie had to offer seeing that this is a low budget film it, it only made two hundred thousand dollars for its budget however there is a remastered blu-ray and dvd available uh, you can still find it on youtube there's already an, a high definition print of the film in fact the colors look blazingly uh, good uh, I had to say this but despite of how blazingly awful this movie was uh, at least it looks as better as, as they can be compared to this crappy DVD that I had to pick <laughs> for only 99 cents but I think you can actually buy the blu-ray and DVD for a lot less than than what you expect but now I feel like you're going to be wasting your money seeing this god-awful flick. But, it's without a doubt one of the worst Christmas movies ever. That is until films like Star Wars Holiday Special came along. Or even Surviving Christmas for that matter. <laughs> Take your pick. But, I'm going to tell you this. If you want to see this shit fest for yourself, I suggest try to find a rare copy, or at this rate, search it online. Yeah, it's available on YouTube. You can find a high definition remastered version available because it looks much better than this cheap DVD that I got. And see this <laughs> movie for yourself to see how 
god awful it really is because it really is bad <laughs> no doubt and <laughs> you're gonna be amazed by having to hear the theme song many, many times because this is the theme song that gets stuck in your head and I'll never go away. You're going to be wanting up singing along with it. I also recommend you to watch the Mystery Science Feeder episode because you're going to be in for a laugh. Otherwise, skip this garbage. It's a piece of shit movie. It's not worth it. But I gotta tell you, I think it would be worth watching if you're drunk. That's all I have to say. So anyway, I give Santa Claus Conquers the Martians a poorly done Christmas movie that I've ever seen. One star. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Much later. Bye!